So most of you know I'm Julie. I um, studied at AUT from 2018 until 2021. I mean, I studied law, but I studied communications before then. Um, so in my background, I've been a litigation solicitor. I've been a lecturer in communication studies, and I've been an award-winning journalist. My current gig is I'm a full-time mum. I've got a six-month-old baby and a two-year-old son. So if, um, apologies if you hear any screaming. I promise they do have a babysitter right now. So they're under control. Um, so as most of you probably know, I also run just a little study business on the side and I sell my, some of my notes from law school. Uh, so I do, 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 I'll share my screen in case you haven't seen my website before. Yeah. So this is my website. It's Julie Schmidt Law. Um, I was top of 13 different papers while at law school. So I sell a whole bunch of my notes, which honestly it took me like so so many hours to make I was trying to think how long the real property ones took me to make and I was thinking like probably over 40 hours just on the notes so yeah I love I love Julie Schmidt Lauren being able to interact with law students and help and have this contribution and um yeah it's just been it's just taken off and just been so much fun so um if you I will be going over my notes um and if you would like to buy them I will whoop, here it is I've got a document which I'll re-upload because um yeah you can only see documents once you've been in so I'll re-upload it and it's got a whole bunch of information and it's got a 10% discount code which is good till tonight okay so moving on to the structure of today I wanted to spend the first like 10-15 minutes just going over my notes and like giving you an overview of the topic and talking about anything that's particularly challenging I feel like covenants are challenging someone else messaged me saying can we go over indefeasibility so we can do that quickly um then we've got a problem question to go through and hopefully you've all read that in advance it's actually from um <laughs> my exam so it's the same question I've already done because I just wanted to make sure my answers were good so that answer got 100% so this is a good one um, so we'll be going over that together and then I'll have a bit of time at the end just for some questions so yeah I'll just get started um, also like feel free to have a mention a question in the chat um, as you throughout the session I don't mind being a little bit flexible all right, so I will start by sharing my screen and just talking a bit about real property. Um, yeah, such a hard topic, honestly, really. <laughs> it's such a hard topic. If you're feeling like really stressed and confused, I was definitely feeling the same. I remember at the end of one of my lectures just being like, looking around and honestly the thought in my head was I bet you every single person in this lecture completely understood that and I'm the only person who didn't get it so at least you know if you are feeling like that I'm sure everyone else is because I got top of this paper so you know it's objectively confusing um so just to give you a rundown of at least what they are teaching in the AUT structure but it should be pretty similar throughout because you know, it's all regulated. Um, so I broke it down into three different sort of overarching topics in real property. The first one is ways that you can modify your land title. So you've got a title, you can have an easement, oh, sorry, you can check a mortgage on it. And these are different types of mortgages. You can put a lease, you can lease your land, you can have a covenant, um, you can have an easement. So this is, you've got your title and these are just different ways that you can modify it. So I call that topic one. Topic two, I call overcoming your Torrens title. So you've got your indefeasible title. It can never be beaten. It's perfect. It's completely 100% certain guaranteed. That's your land and no one can touch it. But in law, there are always little ways that you can touch things. So I've got ways that you can overcome this title. So you've got um, just a, this is just a bit about 
the old system, but you've got your caveats and your unregistered interests. So that's how one way that you can overcome your Torrens title. There's, um, I don't really want to talk about this because I know it's changed since I studied. So I'm just going to ignore that. We've got fraud. We've got manifest injustice, roads, landlocked land. And yeah, that's what I've got for, you've got your Torrens title. How do you get around it? The third topic I've got is just about different types of title ownership that you can have. So in New Zealand, there's cross leases, which like, oh, I just hate cross leases, like both personally and like in law, they're just, um, I just think they're annoying. But anyway, we've got cross leases and then unit titles. You've got building schemes, which, yeah, I've always like think of Stonefields, Stonefields, because that's like a building scheme I'm familiar with and used to go rock climbing in Stonefields and you've got co-ownership. So I'm just going to quickly check back into the session, see if anyone's got a question in the chat so far, because I don't think it pops up when I'm sharing my screen. Ah, there it is. No, nope, looks like everyone's sweet. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a bit about covenants. And if you want me to talk about something else after, just mention it in the chat. Um, yeah, because I personally felt like covenants was very tricky. And it took me a long time to get my head around yeah so covenants we're in the ways that you can modify your land title section so you can modify your land title by adding a covenant to it so covenants operate in equity that means that you can add a note on a title and that means I did work in property law for a bit so I know what this visually looks like it's like you've got a piece of paper which is your title and down the bottom, there'll just be like a little line that's like, hey, just so you know, there's a, someone else has an interest on this title. So it's just like a little note to let people know. So you can notate your title, but you can also not notate your title. And it's still binding if, if dot, 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 there are a lot of different tests to it. So of course, but um, since operating equity, the next person needs notice of it. So you need notice for the title to be binding overall, sorry, for the covenant to be binding overall. If you notate the title, it's always going to be considered that the other person had notice, even if it's just like constructive notice, like the courts will construe that you had notice. Um, but, you know, notice would count of just being like, hey, mate, just letting you know there's this equitable interest. There's a covenant on the title. So that would count. Um, so a really big, <clears throat> excuse me, a really big topic with covenants, since they operate in equity and they're a bit tricky, it's does a covenant pass on to the next owner or lessor? So you've got a covenant on land and someone else buys your land or someone else um, or you pass on your lease to someone else. So does that covenant pass on to that person? So there are two different tests. And honestly, this took me so long to figure out. I just can't explain enough, like how complicated it is to read through all the statutes and the cases. And like, I had to like deduce this test. So I've got the test and it took a long time to figure out. But the first test is for leased land. So the covenant for lease land in order to pass from this person to this person it needs to burden the lessor all right yeah i'll go through this test i'll just go through the steps so it needs to the cover the lease needs to have come into operation after the 1st of january 2008 so that's just because that's when the law changed so okay that's step one step two if it was um, before 2008 it needs to refer to the subject matter of the lease so that's what the statute says section 231 um, and referring to the section of the lease has been interpreted as the touching concern test so basically what that means is it needs to affect the land itself um, no that's not quite right it needs to go to the heart of the lease um 
and it should be about the land itself not just the tenants because yeah that would go to the heart of the lease so for example if it's about um I've got examples from PA Swift that do touch and concern like repairs decorating um so not assigning the lease so that would all go to the heart of the lease um some examples doo -doo -doo. yeah so in this case pna swift paying rent was a covenant that touched and concerned the lease because like it's not directly related to land but you can't really like i think paying rent is like the most important thing about a lease really in some ways so they found that templeman lord templeman said uh yeah that does touch and concern the land um so those are the two yeses if it was after 2008 and if it touches and concerns um no if it was before 2008 and doesn't touch and concern cool so that's leased land passing from this person to this person then you got your second test which is um i've got not leased land so like if you're buying land does the covenant pass over so you've got to go to section 303 of the Property Law Act. Um, and the test is yes, if the covenant is intended to run with the land. If it's restrictive, then always, meaning stopping you from doing something. If it's positive, then only yes, if it's come into operation after 1987, 1st of Jan. If there's no privy of estate, so there's no rental agreement, for example, between the these two people. And this is the really important part. If it burdens land, and this is where I'm talking about like land, 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 like think what you can physically touch, like the actual land. And so it needs to burden this original land and benefit, like burden the land that the covenants related to and benefit someone else's land okay and also the other person needs to have notice so in relation to burdening land and benefiting land which i think is like a really crucial part of this test um yeah always like get your fingers like what can you touch like for example if there's a covenant on land which says every person who buys this piece of land must make dinner for julie every friday night uh it's not benefiting land like i am not land <laughs> it's benefiting a person so that wouldn't count but if it was like your next door neighbor can't build a second story it's restricting the physical land and it's benefiting the land behind because the land behind has more value with a better view arguably all right, I'm going to stop talking about covenants and just check in with everyone and see um, if in the chat, would you like to, is there anything someone would des be desperate to go over? Um, because we've actually gone into 417. So I might move to the problem question unless there's one more thing someone would like to cover quickly would like to cover quickly i'm not telling you to go quickly to ask a question <laughs> clarify um i had rod thomas yeah that's so that's an aut lecturer yeah i had rod thomas all right um yeah i'll just quickly cover into feasibility and then i'll move on to the um problem question so very quickly um yeah interfeasibility came about because you know in all like land is so fundamental to a society operating well because you need to have like how do i put this you're all we're all working hard right and eventually you want to you probably might already own a house or you want to buy a house and 
you want to know that that house will be secure because if you work for 50 years and you're paying off your mortgage and then you finally own your piece of land and then the government comes and is like oh sorry we'll just take that off you goodbye I mean first of all that person would be completely gutted and second of all other people in society wouldn't be as encouraged or motivated to work hard because their the fruits of their labor wouldn't be guaranteed so it's really important for societies to have productive people working hard to know that their land is secure so the system before torrens it was the um goodness does anyone know what exactly it was called state i just got state assurance fund um oh yeah jump in whoever that was deed system the deed system thank you it's been a few years for me <laughs> yeah the deed system um so under that system it was like um one of the main limitations of it was if you bought a piece of land your conveyancer had to go back and check that all the other titles were passed on correctly in order for you to own your land so if you if someone down the line had made a mistake you didn't and that land didn't actually pass to that person therefore it didn't actually pass to that person and then didn't pass to you then you would not legally own your land so it wasn't very secure you had to really rely on having a good conveyancer um or even a good conveyancer back in the day so they introduced this torrens title um to try and make it more secure so the three principles are mirror so the title what you've got on your um, physical piece of paper is directly like what you actually own. There's not going to be some mess up. And even if it was badly conveyed, not properly conveyed before, it doesn't matter. Like you own what it says. Uh, the curtain principle. So yeah, that's like, you shouldn't concern yourself with interest before. And the insurance principle, the state will guarantee that that's your title. Um, and if there's a mistake, they'll pay you out. So they really are guaranteeing it. Okay. So let's go to the problem question. So I hope everyone has had the chance to read it beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, I will get it. Um, I will quickly show you what it is. Yeah. So this is the problem question. So the way I envision going over this is um, asking asking you guys what your what your answers are, and we can work through it together. So for those who haven't read, had the opportunity to read it, you might just want to give it a quick read now. But I'm just going to assume everyone has, so I'll zoom it out and just jump right into A. So we've got Paul and. You know, there's been an unequitable, sorry, <laughs> there's been an equitable, um, actually, you know what, I won't explain it quickly. I'll just assume everyone's read it. Okay, so who wants to jump in? Do you think Paul is guilty of land transfer fraud? no okay who said no oh rohan hi thank you for speaking up tell me more yeah because i was just thinking i mean i'm not too sure but um in land uh, in land transfer act 2017 section 6 explains meaning of fraud which is forgery and other dishonest conduct by the registered owner or the registered owner's uh, agent in acquiring a registered in state yeah. Uh, from the look of what happened here, doesn't really look at. There's no sign of forgery or anything. There's no sign of any any papers being, you know, manhandled or anything. So, so I think it is not 
a fraud, but I don't know. <laughs> um, amazing. Yes. Yes, definitely. You're right. Yep. And I think that's a great way you structured it. And looking back at my paper, I structured my answer very similarly, starting with defining land transfer fraud. And like you said, it's something dishonest. And like, I always think of like a sneaky person being like, he, 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 like I've like cheated you. And you're right here. He hasn't done that. Um, he hasn't been sneaky or dishonest. Yeah. Um, does anyone want to mention... Um, so he he both looked up on land online and he asked his girlfriend who's a law student um so do you think this do you think he was being dishonest by doing this or what do you think about that i don't think he was being dishonest mm -hmm. in fact he was being honest and trying to find out Mm -hmm. Although he didn't consult a lawyer, which might be, mm -hmm. which might be looking at the dishonest action, because that's what we do while we try to buy land or any mm. anything. Yeah. So as his girlfriend, I don't think she was a law student. Yes, but um, I think he should have done his due diligence before in a better way. Mm, okay. Yep. So maybe not fraud, but not perfectly innocent. Yep. So that's when we've got, does someone else want to jump in with question two? Um, would your advice differ if he had sought a lawyer's advice and not Linda's advice? I'm sure there are a lot of people who know the answer. I would often do the same. I'd be like, hmm, a bit awkward. Should I do? I think I might know. Um, just give it a go. Honestly, even if you're wrong, who cares? Like, that's how you learn. Actually, you learn best when you give a wrong answer because you really know um, what you don't know then. So it's really helpful. In that case, um, I do well all the time um, <laughs> in terms of getting stuff wrong. But I think uh, just from memory of a relevant case that it would make a difference um, in the sense of, um, yeah, that um, mm -hmm. uh, the solicitor's advice if that, um, oh, actually, it's as far as I can take it. Yeah, no, that's right. Yes. It would make a difference. Does anyone know the case? Thanks, Ivan. It starts the B. Rhymes with something I won't say. <laughs> Are you thinking of Bunt versus Hallinan? Yes. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, that's the case. Bunt and Hallinan. Um, so do you remember the facts of that case, Rebecca? Um, yeah, it was about the, I can't remember which of the, um, the prior owners, they had a shed at the bottom of their garden to make pottery in. Mm -hmm. um, and Hallinan entered into an agreement to purchase some of the property and was aware that they had the right to use the shed. Mm -hmm. um, he sought legal advice, um, but was told it wasn't binding on him. Um, he's not guilty of fraud because he received legal advice and was not bound to honor the occupation of the shed. Nice. Thank you, Rebecca. That's great. Yep. So, yeah, for sure. So here we've got, you know, really similar facts to Bunt and Helen, in, but they've changed the fact that instead of a lawyer giving advice, it's the law student. So there's a bit of like a niggly thing here that you need to talk about. Um, so would you say you're so I think our initial advice to answer question one fully is um we don't think he's necessarily dishonest of land transfer fraud he didn't do anything sneaky or guilty or like deceitful um he took some steps to like make sure that um his conscience was clean but arguably 
he was a little bit negligent and he really should have got legal advice but on balance probably not guilty of fraud um so that's our initial advice so would it differ if Paul had sought Linda's advice uh a, a lawyer's advice we're saying based on Bunt and Helen and what do you think I think we're we're saying yes um the advice would differ because it would be very clearly not fraud because it would be the facts would be almost exactly the same as Bunt and Helen and and he would have done nothing dishonest he would have taken every possible precaution so I better hurry this up actually this is taking longer um oh no we've still got a bit of time it's only 4 30 no it's okay so do you mean um do you mean that the situation would be the same is that what you're saying yeah I think the material facts would be really similar to Bunt and Helen and if he had sought a lawyer's advice so in both cases he'd be not guilty is that what you're saying in my opinion yeah so I would say like I always look at legal answers as a spectrum like 100% yes is here and 100% no is here my answer is always somewhere in the middle I would say with number one it's sort of like yeah I'd say 75% likely he's not you know um didn't isn't guilty of land transfer fraud but I'd say with question if he got a lawyer's advice I'd say it's more like 95% likely that he's not guilty or maybe even I'd go as far as like 96% you know he can never be too certain but it's it's pretty clear he wouldn't have done anything wrong um whoops this one was a bit funny so if Paul had become aware of Ollie's claim after entering into the agreement but prior to registration what arguments could be made that this may constitute land transfer fraud and why? So there's a particular case that um, needs to be mentioned here. Does anyone know the case? It starts with NZ, a country you're all in, and I'm not in right now. Uh, NZ, meet nominees and sim. Um, yeah, so in that case, Justice Tipping said, um, if someone enters into a contract to buy land, which is completely binding, and it would be really hard to get out of that contract, um, and then they find out about an equitable interest, it's kind of unfair to then be like, ah, well, you haven't registered your interest yet. You found out about this equitable interest. Therefore, you're guilty of fraud because you had prior knowledge. Because if you found out about this equitable interest when you're already in a binding contract and you can't get out of that contract easily, it's as if you're already fully committed to that property. So... In some instances, justice to being said, even if you have just entered into a contract and haven't registered the land in that kind of weird gray area, if you find out about an equitable interest, you might not be guilty of land transfer fraud if you still um, go ahead and register the property and ignore the equitable interest. So that's an argument I would advance if um, Paul became aware of the back shed after entering into the agreement but before registering um there's another argument that um i mentioned and and rod thomas wrote this paper in 1994 and he's talking about like the essence of fraud and really how it's just about someone being deceitful um or dishonest so like really that sneak like I really tried to do something bad here um so he's saying that just knowing about the interest and then registering your title um it's not necessarily dishonest if you didn't realize that it was binding you know, you might know of an 
equitable interest. Yes, you've got the knowledge, but if you didn't realize you're doing anything dishonest, then it doesn't really go to the heart of um, section do, 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 section six, which is like that dishonesty thing. Um, so that's an argument you could advance. It's Rod Thomas's argument, the lecture for AUT. So probably worth advancing that if you have him as a lecturer, because it's a good kudos to him. Um, yeah, any questions so far? All right, seems to be going good so far. No one has any questions. Um, so would it have made any difference to your answer if Paul had become aware of Ollie's claim after being registered on the title? Does anyone have an idea about this? Aware after... What, sorry, um, what what are they saying? What's been registered on the title? The actual interest, do you mean? Or, um, would it have made any difference? Or him or Paul somehow? Um, Ollie's claim, so his equitable right to um, use that back shed, his lease for the back shed. So would it have made any difference if he knew of like he didn't know of the shit at all. And then after he'd registered, someone goes and tells him about Ollie's lease. Um, I've got something in the chat here. Is he a bona fide purchaser? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Thank you, Isla. And who just spoke, which I missed. Was it Ruby? Yeah. Thank you for that. Yep. So he wouldn't be bound because he's the but I've had a pitch of value without notice. <laughs> Always a mouthful. Um, yeah, so that one's like a bit of a... Um, do -do -do. I'll just see if I've got anything else. Um, yeah, in my answer, I just explain, just for completeness, that unregistered interests operate in equity, and then I quote assets in Mary Rohi, Mary Rohi, um, so to be bound, you need to have notice of it. So it's not constructive notice where the courts construe that you have notice, even if you actually didn't, it has to be like actual notice or willful blindness. Um, so do, 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 um, yeah. So unless you can prove he's willfully blind, if you didn't have actual notice, then he would be sweet. Um, okay, so I'll move on. You've been asked instead to give legal advice to Ollie, not Paul. Um, you form the view that in the circumstances there was no land transfer fraud by Paul. What advice would you give to Ollie on possible ways to overturn um, that registration and what could be the possible outcomes of that advice. So I'm just going to share my notes, which I remember. Um, so it's fraud. Now how, sorry, it's not fraud. So how, how else could we overcome this Torrens indefeasible title? Now that these two are on the same page, I'm, I'm ready to put a new person to the team. Well, I'm just going to, wait, were you about to say something, Madison? I just muted you, but were you about to, it sounded like an ad. No, oh. sorry, I just forgot about this session and quickly jumped on and have all oh, that. Oh, no problem. Welcome. Um, We're up to um answering a question in the, uh answering question two of the problem question okay um cool so yeah 
it's not fraud how else if you're ollie's lawyer would you argue that he can overcome this title <laughs> sorry it's me is that the manifest injustice angle yes nice ivan yeah yeah so you could go for manifest injustice um do you want to explain more like what what do you know about how he could overcome uh that interest of manifest injustice um i think it comes down to establishing that it's unconscionable uh to allow it to stand but i'm not too sure of the particular wording nice yeah yep. nice yep does anyone else uh, want to jump in for a bit of a manifest injustice chat All right. Um, yeah, so Manifest Injustice, it's a new one. I think it comes, it was just introduced to the Act in 2017. So when I was studying in 2019, there were no cases actually about Manifest Injustice. Um, so I'd be curious, do you guys know if there have been any come out post-2019? I'm going to take silence as probably a no. Um, so what I've got for this is, um, yeah, uh, relief. So in my answer, I've just got, um, it's recommended yeah, he could try overcome it with manifest unjust, mani um, if the title was manifestly unjust. Um, so relief under the section is only granted if um, damages money is not appropriate. Um, so that's from section 55, subsection three of the Land Transfer Act. Um, so section 55, subsection four, guides the court on exercising its discretion. So it's like a discretionary one. So there's a bit of guidance. There's like different things stated as hey, you can look at these and use this to influence your decision. You don't have to, if you're a judge, but you can. Um, but Rod Thomas in an article said, it's possible that judges will just really look at this criteria, like look at this as criteria rather than just like broad overarching, you can think of these things. So um, the criteria are... Um, there are three main categories, like statutory illegality, personal circumstances, and um, the type of interest you have in the land. So, yeah, they're all stated in this section 55, subsection 4. There's probably like half a dozen or more things listed. Um, so does anyone want to have a go at which one might be relevant um i could get the section up if that's helpful i'll see how quickly i can do it mm -hmm. um Yeah, so we've got section 55, subsection 4. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's a list of the things that the court can take into consideration. So it's like, um, you know, the personal circumstances, if there's anything special about the land. Um, any, yeah, it's like... I think um, I remember my lecturer hating this one and I can see why it's because it's like very unclear and you know we're talking about land here and how important it is for land to be clear like who owns and who doesn't and how you can overcome it and then you've got all these like yeah is it significant to the person how is their conduct so it's like very you know like airy fairy <laughs> um, 
so I'll just push ahead. So in my answer, I said, um, yeah, it's plausible. He could go for maybe six subsection, like related to this one, if the length of time, because he had occupied that shed for 15 years. So it's a pretty decent time. Um, I've got I, because he's like, pottery is my life. He's built it years ago. His children played in it. Like he's emotionally invested in it. Um, I've got working against him E. Because it's a, it's not a fee simple title, it's just an unregistered lease, so it's not like the best um, title. So yeah, I've got that, and I sum it up with um, talking about, you know, this is a new section. It's not clear. Ollie might have to go to court and test it, and um, to know the answer because it, we don't know how the courts are going to react to the section. So my final thing that I mention is perhaps it's better he brings an in personam claim, just like a standard in personam claim um, for breaching an essential term of the contract of the lease. Um, if there is some sort of agreement between the two, just like a standard claim and contract instead, that's probably a better bet. Um, how would you get around three? Um, an order under this section may only be made if the court is satisfied that in the circumstances the injustice could not probably be addressed by compensation yeah so I mean that's when you really have to talk about like the what can money not buy and it's like you know the emotional investment like his kids grew up in it or like if someone built it themselves or like you know a good one would a good one god that sounds bad but like if someone's ashes are buried like someone's relatives ashes I'm just thinking of other examples um or maybe there's like some sort of Maori like historic connection to that land that's you know spiritual so these are some of the ways that you could get around um like money could never compensate for some of those things um all right, I will plug ahead because actually I am taking a while to answer these. I thought I was good for time, but time just flies when you get to talk so much. I just, it, it flies for me. It's probably going slow for you. <laughs> um, so I've got, Ollie was overseas when he obtained the title. He was in India studying pot making. Um, he found out about it one month before he started trailing. So he found out about it seven months ago. Um, and seven months ago, he said that Paul cleared a shed of his things and had purchased the land. So does his knowledge make a difference in regards to whether he can um, overcome the title with the cause of action manifest injustice? I'll give a hint. Yeah, this is like probably not worth dwelling on because it's just a technical one about the statute. But um, yeah, you need to have um, like uh, so that this manifest injustice couldn't just go on forever, um, and like make all lands fully uncertain. They just say that six months after you know or ought reasonably to have known of this um, like person taking away your interest, you need to bring a claim. So Ollie's was seven months ago that he knew. All he knew was that the shed was being cleared of his things and that, um, yeah, Paul had bought the title. So I just wrote in my answer, like, you know, um, I explained that, the section, um, what I just said. And then it's like, you know, he probably should have known that Paul wasn't going to uphold his lease because he had bought the land and he had started moving his stuff out. So it's arguable he fits into this, like, 
became aware or reasonably to have become aware. Um, yeah, so that was my answer with that. And moving on quickly to... Um, this question so this one's all about leases so you discover that ollie has been in occupation of the shed for the past three years would his position be different if the duration or of ollie's occupation was not for 15 years but a period to be decided between them so that's about what if there's an uncertain amount of time between them the second question is um oh wait i'll just deal with them one at a time and I'll go quickly. I'll say yes, because for a lease, you need um, you need to have um, all of these things, like a fixed or periodic time. So you have to know when the lease is going to start and when it ends. So if it's like not clear when that is, then it is not a valid lease. Even it, it's not a valid unregistered equitable lease. Equitable and registered need the same things. So that wouldn't count. Um, question two is um, what about if his lease extended the area, um, but Ollie can't identify exactly where that area is? And I'm again going to say then it wouldn't be a valid lease because you need certainty of premises for there to be a valid lease. Um, the final one, the shed um, also has some of Virginia's lawn mowing and gardening implements. And I'm again going to say doesn't count because there's no exclusive possession. Um, so finally, we've got this access issue. So like, let's say Ollie does have a lease over the shed and it is binding. Um, but it's like at the back of the garden. Um, so how does he walk on and off to his shed? So I've got, um, oh wait, I'll see what you guys think. Cause we've, I actually gone quickly. What do you think if, um, he can't get on to his lease, it's how would he legally maybe be able to overcome that? Sorry if you can hear my kids. <laughs> um, would you do it with an? Would you do it with an easement? Yeah. Okay. Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you can't do it as it's not landlocked land because it's a lease in essence. So you, um, all you could get an easement to cross Paul's land to be able to access the shed. Yes, it, you're right. I guess the question then is how would you get that easement but yes i think an easement would be ideal yeah so yes do you have to have the consent of both parties as well for an easement like you both have to agree to it do you not yeah so um often yep so let's say paul doesn't want to give that i think that's a good like um a good thing to include yeah and i think i missed that for my answer like Try and get Paul's consent. Um, but if he doesn't, if he doesn't agree, um, thanks. For that. Hmm? I can't tell you any cases, but I'm just wondering if it's related at all to the provisions that enable landlocked land to be resolved. Yeah. You know, where the court the court orders a, a sale or the court orders access via its I can't explain exactly what the what that's called, but that's what's on my mind anyway. Yes, yeah. So I agree. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, I think it's related to landlocked land. Um, I haven't heard of this one that it needs to be owned land. I could be wrong, but I have the, the landlocked land in my answer. Um, so it's where there's land where there's no reasonable access. Then the courts will 
um, potentially grant reasonable access. So that could be in the form of an easement. Um, so different things the court will consider is like, did you purchase the land and it was already landlocked or did it become landlocked? Or, um, yeah, I guess it's about, but yeah, did you acquire your interest when it was, um, you already knew it was landlocked or not? So for Paul, so sorry, for Ollie, I've got, um, you know, he could apply under section 327 for the court to grant him reasonable access. Um, so he has to show that he has no reasonable access and that's in 326. And um, when deciding whether they will grant him relief, they'll consider some of these factors in 329 that I was just talking about. Um, so I've got, like, my opinion was that it's likely he would get relief um, because when he acquired the interest, he did have access to that um, shed. And, um, you know, like this Kingfish Lodge case, um, they like bought landlocked land in, um, I think it's like Marlborough, something like that, Marlborough Sounds maybe, and they like knew it didn't have access to it except by boat, and then they applied to the courts to get access. So the courts are like, no, 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 you got this land cheaper knowing it didn't have access. You can't like sneakily come and try and get this. So the court said no here. Um, so I compared that in my answer to Ollie's situation where he didn't do that. He just genuinely had the interest before it became landlocked. Um, I also talk about like reasonable access might be like an easement by foot or maybe by vehicle. Depends. Um, yeah, depends. But probably just an easement granting him yeah, small vehicle or foot access. Whew, all right. That is um, the end of that problem question. Well, um, your brains are probably fried now, but I've got a couple, not as long as I hoped, but a couple minutes now for, does anyone have a burning question that they want me to cover before we finish? Hi, Julie. No, I was just... Oh, sorry. Uh, you go, Lottie. Um, I was just wondering, in these um, land um, or real property answers, um, is there room to discuss uh, a dissenting judge's opinion? Or if you think that the area of law is a little bit grey, that it could go either way? Or is it better just to uh, go with statute and apply it and use some case law that backs up that opinion mm, okay yes good question um yeah, let me think. i think the best way i could i could answer this is you do have limited time in exams of course but I, like I said, I consider answering legal questions as like a spectrum. So you never want to just jump in a hundred percent and say, um, like pick an answer and justify it, I guess, unless the question really asks, asks you to do that. But, um, usually it's like offer advice or you're the lawyer, what would you do? So I think, um, it could be worth I would say not dissenting judgments because that might just be a little bit too academic. Um, if it's like trying to advise your client, you just, I would always put myself in my client's shoes and just think like, what do they need to know? They're my client. So, you know, if the dissenting judgment makes the law potentially unclear in the future, then it might be worth bringing up. But if it's like a judge has a different opinion and it doesn't relate to that advice, um then it's probably not worth it unless the question is like asking you to discuss the pros and cons of a law rather than advise a client um but yeah if the question is about like a problem question saying advise a client then I would definitely um 
mention the pros and cons of your client's um, uh, scenario, but always give an answer to your client. I think that's fair to the client. Um, I've also got a guide that I think is would be very helpful for this um, discussion. It's about how to answer legal problem questions. And I go over all of um, like what to bring up, what not to bring up. I use a torts example, but it's relevant for any problem question. So I talk about that legal spectrum and a whole bunch of different stuff. So that um, that could help. And I can see another question sort of related to um, answering problem questions as well. And the it's um, is it worth comparing old statutes to current? I would say if you're advising your client and it's not directly relevant to your client's situation, like don't do it. But if it's a, you know, in law, you get two types of questions. One is called like a normative question where it's like, what do you think about, write an essay about manifest injustice. Do you think it's um, certain enough or do you think it creates too much ambiguity in the law? I think that's the type of questions where you can bring up these like dissenting opinions and these like old statutes and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, when it comes to advising clients, I'm a hundred percent just like, I always think I'm your lawyer. You're my client. When I write answers, it's like, I'm just, I've got my client in mind. So I'm just trying to think like someone's actually walked into my office. What do they need to know? They need to know like what the law is and whether they're going to win or lose. And how much certainty, um, how certain I am that they're going to win or how certain I am that they're going to lose. So we're at time, but I'll just keep going. Um, if anyone wants, needs to leave now, I'll just say thank you so much for coming. And I've got um, a document with all the info from the session and I've got a 10% discount for you up until midnight tonight on any of the notes on my website um so honestly I wish I could have bought my notes when I was a student I think they are really super objectively helpful I think the way they um are color-coded and the way they're visually structured it it students aren't cheating they're genuinely learning the information better because of the way it's laid out and structured so um, yeah, you've got the 10% code. It's land 10 off, but it's written in that document um, if you want to jump off and get those. Um, yeah, okay. So I will answer Joanne's question. Ah, thank you, Lottie. Also, one more thing if people are signing off. If you wouldn't mind, if you did like this session, just writing a comment in the chat of like a little testimonial and if I could use that plus your first name in any of my social media posts coming up, because I've got a few more webinars that I'd like to promote. Um, yeah, I'd appreciate that if you, if anyone would like to do that. Um, so I'll go to Joanne. Can you also let us know how long your answers per question were, um, given the mark allocation? Mm, yeah, okay. That's a really good question. Um, I've got like this whole framework of how I divide my time in exams. So for example, this real property exam, um, which I got 95% and I forgot that and I was really stoked when I saw it again. So yay, go me. <laughs> oh God. Um, I've been in Australia too long. I'm losing my Kiwi to a poppy syndrome thing. Um, so there's three questions and they're three hours. It was a three hour exam. So I spent, I divided the time evenly in thirds and as soon as I wrote a little note on my exam of the time to spend and as soon as I reached that time I would just drop my pen just drop in the middle of the sentence and move to the next question because um, you really need to divide your time carefully in exams so I can show you I didn't fill up a full exam oh I did I filled up a full exam book but um, and my questions were like I don't know. Um, I guess I just wrote as much as I could um, in the time that I had allocated for myself. So I, since they were all worth equal marks, I tried to 
ideally this booklet is a third on each third 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 um but for example on some of those questions about the lease I write pretty short and sharp answers because I don't want to waste time when it's quite a simple answer but on some of the first questions in that problem question um I give it a bit more time so for example that's one of the lease answers it's quite short there's yeah you've you could talk more about leases and this and that, but it's got to be, you don't want to waste your your time and your, um, yeah, your writing. Hey, thanks to everyone who's leaving testimonials. I appreciate that. Um, can you share your answer with us, please? Um, no, sorry, I can't. But in my guide for how to structure answers to legal problem questions, I do share a model answer. And it's based off of a torts question, um, which I received 100% in, but it's not directly copied. Um, so you can find a model answer there, and that will be relevant to answering real property or land law questions. And that will be helpful, but I can't share my exam paper. I think that's unethical. Um, oh, thanks everyone for the comments. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer one or two more questions if you have any. Um, uh, thank you so much for the feedback. Yeah, otherwise, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Like, I had a blast, but that's because I got to talk the whole time. So you guys are probably exhausted because it's harder to listen to people than to talk. But yeah, thank you so much. So appreciate being able to share and connect with you guys online. Um yeah, oh, so happy to read that just chat that just came up that you're feeling far more prepared for the exam. Like, yes, that was really awesome. Very much what I was hoping. Hoping that everyone is feeling a little bit less stressed and a little bit more like clear because gosh, this is a hard paper. Like just hang in there, you know, oh, nearly done. All right, so are there... Um, are there any more questions? Oh, thanks, Cece. Nice. Thanks for coming. I noted um, the video being recorded. Is it going to be uploaded somewhere for reference? Or... Yeah. I don't know yet, to be honest. I probably, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I am recording it because I want to use it for something, but I haven't decided. Um, like where it'll go and I have to think of privacy and stuff so yeah what do you think <laughs> Ivan what do you think would you like a copy of it after or I mean it might be nice to share with some other people who couldn't make it um, um from a personal perspective I'd use it for personal reference in terms of the connection between what you're saying and what's shown on the screen um, um I'm not I'm not sure of it going wider outside of the pool of people that are watching the video to be quite honest okay yep that's fair all right I'll um I'll keep that in mind and I think since I didn't ask everyone's permission I won't share it um publicly but yeah it might be nice to make the recording available to the people who weren't able to make it I think I had about 90 people signed up so we got about half so we good to share with them um and yeah maybe a couple other students somehow but not in a majorly public way um if i could suggest if in terms of the other uh, webinars later this week if you wanted to perhaps do that maybe canvas that and I, I would say people would take the opportunity to flip their cameras off yeah you know. yeah yeah fair. yeah thanks for that i'll uh, be back in mind yeah Yep. Yeah. All right. Um I want to um just quickly um yeah take a um copy some of these um testimonials because I don't want to end the session and then lose everything. So I'm just gonna take screenshots of all these um yeah but so nice to see you all and yep that's the screenshot of just the um testimonials 
so nice to see you all and thank you so much for showing up i'm sure you guys will all do well because you're all going above and beyond getting extra yeah. one can only hope <laughs> yeah oh yeah you <laughs> did great rohan you had great answer at the start that was really good yeah <laughs> all right oh this is such a hard paper <laughs> yeah but yeah it's just a lot of things a lot of content so it's just yeah, it's a bit hard but i think it's it's quite interesting as well to be yeah. fair so yeah very interesting and honestly quite a lucrative area to work in yeah yeah yeah, yeah. cool i might go back to property one day all right i'm i think i've got my screenshots of all the um chats so i'll end it there um yeah all right thank you again all so much for coming and Thanks, yeah hope to see you later in the week if you, uh, you're coming to any more otherwise yeah just hope to keep in touch <laughs>